gather far across the sea. Let us stand allegiance to a land that's free. Let us all be Number 129 in your hymnal, 129. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Battle hymn of the Republic. Let's all stand together as we sing. 129. We're going to sing that first, third, and last together. Mine eyes have seen. Welcome to All-American Sunday, and I uh, hope you had a great fourth yesterday, and uh, the activities that uh, went on, whatever you were involved in, and it's good to see you in the church service this morning. We're going to start out just a little bit differently. Uh, we want to say our pledges today. We're going to say our pledge to the American flag, and then a pledge to the Christian flag, and then a pledge to the Bible. You may not be familiar, I hope you're familiar with the Pledge of Allegiance, but in case you're not familiar to the Christian pledge of the Christian flag... Uh, there was an insert in your bulletin that you can pull out. You're welcome to use that for the pledge to the Christian flag and then the pledge to the Bible. But let's do those pledges together this morning, all right? Let's do the American flag first, shall we? Ready? Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now I pledge to the Christian flag. Ready? Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands. One Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again with life and liberty for all who believe. And now I pledge to the Bible. Ready? Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet 
and a light unto my path. I will hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. And let's pray, shall we? Father, we lift our voices up to you now in prayer. And Lord, we're thanking you for our country, for the principles upon which it was founded, for the faith in God upon which it was founded. And Lord, we also pray for our country for how far we've drifted away from the original purpose and founding of our nation. And Lord, our, our prayer this morning would be that you would help us to begin in, even in this room, among this small group, a turning back to God in our country. For we realize the only step forward for our country would be a step back to God. And so, Lord, I pray you would have our attention this morning, that you'd bless the music and honor and bless the preaching of your word, that your will would be accomplished in our lives today. And I ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, you may be seated.
All right. Boy, that's good. I like that a lot. Well, we uh, want to see how many states we have represented here this morning, all right? And uh, this is not, you know, the state of confusion or the state of sleep or whatever. Uh, we want to know what state you were born in, all right? Uh, that's the state you'll represent today. Um, now, how many Ohioans are here today? You're born and bred Buckeyes, okay? I figured that would be the majority, all right? All right, that's good. And uh, get that done. All right, now, I want you to, you're born from another state. Stand up for us, and we'll go through and find out what state you were born. Look at this. Wow, great. All right, we'll start with the choir, okay? Hold on. I'll come back to you. Let's start in the choir. Somebody start. Tanya? Minnesota. Minnesota. All right. Who's, is somebody else out here in Minnesota? Okay. You're just a fan, huh? All right. <laughs> Okay? Go right across the front, Wendy. Florida. Florida. Okay? California. 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 West Virginia. West, I didn't say foreign countries. So, yeah. How many West Virginia? Oh, yeah, there we go. Good. One, two. What do we have up here? Three, four. Four of you? Four of you from West Virginia, huh? Okay. All right. Next. Kentucky. Kentucky. All right. Andy. Indiana. Who's yours? Okay. Brett. New York and Kentucky. Okay. Okay, all right. So let's start over here. Carol, Kentucky as well. It's four for Kentucky. Wow. Brother Van Gelder, New York. Good. Jackie, Maryland. Good. All right. All right. Let's go up here. Scotty, New Jersey. Good. What you talking about? All right. <laughs> Sit down. All right. All right, Quentin. Oh, no. <laughs> that goes over big, doesn't it? Come on. Such were some of you. But you'd, he's been washed. He's been sanctified. He's been justified. All right. Joe. New York. Another New Yorker. All right. Scotty. Thank you. Leanne. Another New Jersey girl. All right. Okay. Felicia. Colorado. All right. Great. Xavier. Virginia. All right. Uh, she's saved and baptized now in Ohio. Amen. <laughs> Violetta. Virginia. Good. Okay. Indiana. Another Hoosier, huh? Okay. All right, Mike, North Carolina. I didn't know that. Tar Heel, I didn't know that. Okay, back here, yes, ma'am. Oh, the big pencil, huh? All right, Pennsylvania. I don't know. We'll see. All right. Yes, sir. Another Jersey guy, huh? Okay. Leland? Texas. All right. David, are you standing? Another Florida. Okay. 
Uh, John? Oh, you were standing up. Roy, did I miss you? Roy, where were you born? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, Roy, good, good. Dean, are you standing or are you just standing? California. Wow. All right. All right. Everybody, I get everybody? All right. 17 different states are here this morning. Isn't that great? How about that? That's great. Now, we want to take a minute, and uh, we want to honor those who have served in the armed forces of the United States. Freedom is never free. It, uh, it costs some much. It costs some everything. And, uh, but that's why we're free to worship here this morning and gather together. And so we want to honor those. If you, the choir is going to sing a salute to the armed forces. And uh, if you served, when you hear your branch of the service, uh, your song, then you stand. If you had a family member serve in that branch, then you can stand representing them this morning. Okay? And so uh, you be prepared for that as the choir sings for us the salute to the armed forces.
Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you for serving your country and for your loved ones for serving your country as well. That was good. Well done, choir. Well done. All right. Now, <clears throat> we have some announcements. Listen carefully, if you would. All right. Uh, regular schedule today, uh, 530. We have a Christian growth class. It meets down in the conference room right across from our nursery. And uh, tonight's subject will be on the church and uh, help you understand what the church is and the importance of the church and uh, what, what the role it ought to play in your Christian life. And so and that's open to anyone who'd like to attend. Always have a good group there on Sunday evening. Then tonight at 6.30 here in the auditorium, we'll have our evening service, and we have missionary Jess Kawili with us. Uh, he and his wife are home from the Philippines, and um, you will enjoy Brother Kawili. He is uh, from the Philippines and came here and got Bible college training and then went back there and is uh, pastoring a church and has planted many other churches, and uh, he's just a delightful, delightful young man. And uh, you'll enjoy hearing him tonight. And uh, so plan to be here this evening for that uh, special treat tonight. And after the service tonight, uh, the teens are going to have one of their fundraisers for Youth Conference, which is for them coming up the end of this month, right at the end of July. Uh, they've got some chili dogs and nachos and some things like that after the service. So uh, plan to stay around, get to talk to the missionary a little bit, and um, help the teens out and get yourself a snack after church Sunday night, all right? <clears throat> That'll be a great, great time. All right, now remember, uh, this next week starts our Vacation Bible School. So uh, workers, remember that. Uh, Going to be at 6.30 on Monday through Thursday night. Uh, make sure you're here by 6 o'clock if you're one of the workers. Uh, tonight afterwards, I'll just need to meet with the refreshment crew, okay, and uh, make sure they know where the Oreos go when they come in. But um, we'll, uh, we'll meet and make sure we're on the same page with the refreshments each night. And uh, it's going to be a great week. So I hope you can pray. And uh, if you're not able to be here, we will have service as usual Wednesday night. So come at the, uh, you might want to come half hour early. Instead of 7 o'clock, come at 630. And uh, we'll kind of start with Brother Hamby. And uh, he'll be here to do the program with the children. And uh, we'll kind of put that together. Then when they dismiss out, we'll go ahead and uh, gather together and uh, continue with our service for another half hour. So, all right. And uh, that's how Wednesday night will work. All right, I think that's all I have right now. We want to take a moment and welcome any guests we have with us in the service. We're always pleased when people visit with us in the service. And if you're not a member here at Bible Baptist Church, or if you brought a guest with you today, would you honor us by standing just for a moment? We could find out who you are and where you're from. Okay? Terry, you got some guests over here? Okay. Jay and Austin. Good. Great. Good to have you guys today. Praise the Lord. Thank you for being here. Good. Thank you. All right. Let's go back here in the middle. Yes, sir. Good. Gary, good to have you this morning. Thank you for coming. Great. All right. We have a family back here. Who's going to do the talking? <laughs> Villa Toro. Okay. Where are you from? Ohio, that's, that's the state you're from. Okay, all right. Well, it's good to have you visiting in the service today. Thank you for being here. God bless you. That's great. Thank you. The ushers hand you a card. If you'll be kind enough to fill that out for us, we sure would appreciate it. In a little bit, we have the offering, and you just put that card in the plate if you would. And uh, we'll have a record of your visit with us this morning. And you keep the pen as our gift to you for coming today. We're glad you're here. All right, let's give them a warm welcome, shall we?
127, 127, oh beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of green. <clears throat> One, two, seven. Let's sing that first all together. Oh, beautiful for space skies, for me to the front of the book <clears throat> number three in your hymnal amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me let's all stand together once more as we sing amazing grace on that first all together amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a Make somebody feel welcome, especially our guests. We'll come back and sing those last stanzas together.
Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace had brought me, saved us far, and grace will lead me home. When we've been there, when we've been there, ten Let's sing that first verse one more time as everybody finds your seats here. Uh, let's sing that a cappella. Let's sing that without the instruments. We're going to sing that all together. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. may be seated. Good singing. Ushers will come. We're ready to receive our offering now this morning. We'll give as God has blessed and prospered you. And we'll ask God's blessing on our giving today. Brother Taylor, lead us in our prayer this morning. Would you please? Okay, let's pray. Dear Father, we we come together now, Lord, to just praise you. Thank you, Father, for being the mighty God that you are. Thank you for these men and women that gave all, Lord. But we first of all thank you for giving your only begotten Son. Whosoever would believe in him would have everlasting life. Lord, Lord thank you for giving it all. Lord, as we take up this offering now, may it be pleasing in thy sight. A portion that already belongs to you. And we know that it all belongs to you anyway. We just ask for your blessing on this offer. Thank you for this day. Be with the pastor as he opens up your word and gives us what you would have us to have today. May all be attentive and listen to what the Word has to say to us, Lord. May it all be pleasing in thy sight. We thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
like you to take your Bibles this morning, if you would, please, and turn to Judges chapter 2, please. Judges chapter 2. <clears throat> we are going to read verses 6 through 10 of Judges chapter 2 for our scripture reading. We'll read the verses responsively as we normally do. We begin together on 6, then I'll read 7, and together on 8, and alternating until we end together on verse 10 of Judges chapter 2. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the Scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's Word. And let's begin on verse 6 of Judges chapter 2. Ready? And when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man into his inheritance to possess the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being a hundred and ten years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in timnath Heris, in the Mount of Ephraim, on the north side of the hill Gaash. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, we ask you to add your blessing now to the reading of the Scripture this morning. Lord, it sure has been a good service already. Thank you for the wonderful music and the message and the songs and for the fellowship together with other believers. Lord, it's, uh, it's just good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. And Father, we're asking you now that you'll uh, speak to our hearts through your word. We want to thank you for the Bible this morning. Lord, I pray that each of us will be prepared and ready to give it our utmost attention, our undivided attention, and that you'll give us ears to hear what the Spirit would say to us this morning. Lord, bless us special now to that end. In Jesus' name, amen. In New York Harbor stands a lady with a torch raised to the sky and all her see her Lord, raise to the sky and all who kneel there live forever as all the saved can testify. I'm so glad to be called a Christian. Set free, unashamed, I proclaim the 
had a rugged cross is my statue of liberty. Our Heavenly Father, we bow before you now in prayer this morning as we come to the preaching of your word. Father, I would ask you that you would help us now this morning to give our careful attention to the only book you've ever written. We thank you for your holy word. The holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And that we have the privilege and honor to hold Bibles in our hands this morning. I believe the Word of God is quick, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, I believe your Word will accomplish in our hearts what you desire it to accomplish. And I pray you'd help us each to listen to what the Spirit of God would say to us this morning. We're Christians first. We're also Americans. And I pray, God, that you would Help us to turn our country back to you. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of Judges, if your Bible's open there to Judges 2, the book of Judges gives the history of the nation of Israel for about 300 years after Joshua, after the death of Joshua. Israel, as most of you are familiar with the book of Judges, they would decline and go away from God, backslide, and then God would raise up a judge. He would, he would use a nation, by the way, to oppress them and to take them captive in some cases. Then he'd raise a judge up when they'd cry out to him and he'd deliver them, only for them to repeat the process. It's, Israel was a unique nation. God's chosen people. And... Uh, no other nation had ever been established by God like Israel was established by God. There are many stunning parallels as you read the book of Judges between Israel and America. Israel established by God and I believe our country founded certainly on the laws of God and the principles of God and I believe with the favor of God. God asked one thing for Israel is God gave them himself, God gave them his law, and God gave them a land. And in return, he asked that they would love him, obey him, and serve him. And Israel did not do that. They denied the Lord, they defied the law, and they defiled the land, and so God had to judge them. Thus the book of Judges. But I believe America had a Christian beginning as well. Don't, don't let the history revisionists change the true facts of history. There's too many <clears throat> places you can still go to in our country and find the true history of our country. And by the way, while I'm at that, let me just put in, I, I, I think... I think the day's coming, by the way, I think children ought to still learn to write cursive. Because they need to be able to write it and they need to be able to read it. Much of what you read of history was written in cursive writing and you need to be able to write it. Uh, I had one of the young men the other day to sign a, a document and, and he couldn't sign his name. He printed his name. Because they didn't ever taught you how to write cursive to sign a document. It's amazing, and, and by the way, the, I'll, I'll add to that, the, the day is probably here where those of you with children in the state school system need to think very seriously whether that's the right move or not. It's, uh, there is an agenda, and you'll see that as we get further into the message this morning. That's not the message, but that's part of it. George Washington, in his farewell address, said this statement, Quote, reason and experience both forbid us that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. 
In other words, you're never going to have any kind of national morality separated from religious principle. It's impossible. You're not going to get good without God. You won't have people behaving good without God. John Adams, America's second president, said the United States Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate for the government of any other. We too, in America, have been given the Lord, the law, and the land. And we have denied Him, and we have defied Him, and He is defiling our land, allowing it to be so. I don't think it takes many, uh, much thinking to understand how America has denied the Lord. Most of us in this room have lived long enough to see the Lord slowly be expelled out of every area of our life. Whether it's the, 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 the schools, whether it's public places, whether it's courtrooms, whether it's our money, whether it's the Pledge of Allegiance, on and on it goes to where we're even fighting today about what we're allowed to say in the church and from behind the pulpit. It's no longer anymore a situation of separation of church and state. It's a separation of God from our country is what the battle is. Did you know that just a few years ago, for the first time, atheists were knocked from the top of America's most hated list? They're no longer number one on America's most hated list. That honor now belongs to the Tea Party. It really dovetails, and I'll give you some statistics here in a minute, America's acceptance of atheism. In a 2008 study done by Connecticut's Trinity College, 15% of Americans polled as nuns, N-O-N-E-S, a group that is comprised of vehement atheists, agnostics, or people without any religious affiliation. I want you to I want to remind you that was 2008. In 1990, only eight percent categorized themselves as that. Eighteen years later, it's 15 percent, nearly doubled in 18 years. As recently as 1990, all but 7% of Americans claimed a religious affiliation, a figure that had held constant for decades. But today, 17% say they have no religion. Most of them, obviously, since 1990. Throughout the 90s and into this new century, Americas, it says, the fraction of Americans who strongly agreed that religious leaders should not try to influence governmental decisions doubled from 22% in 91 to 40% in 2008. They also said the fraction who insisted that religious leaders should not try to influence on how people vote rose to 45% from just 30% in 1991. You heard me quote last Sunday evening that 73% of those in the age group 18 to 29 think that a marriage between two women or two men is okay. What was frightening is, and I didn't realize how much it had changed, in 1990, that same poll, it was, it was, it was absolutely reversed. Same age group, 18 to 29-year-olds, in 1990, 73% believed it was wrong. And, in, and in now in just uh, 25 years, 
it's completely flipped. America has denied the Lord. We've denied the God who gave us our land. But we not only denied the Lord, we're defying the law. The Supreme Court says it's against the law to put up the Ten Commandments. And that's really odd because it's on their building in a public place. I don't know what the reasoning is, whether it's reasoning if you display them, somebody might obey them. But we're doing just what Israel did. But it's the official position of the government of the United States that the Ten Commandments are dangerous. We surely wouldn't want our children to see, Thou shalt not kill, or Thou shalt not steal. Our children, honor your father and mother. We've gotten so far away from what's right. Where we've come to the point in America where they call evil good and good evil. We've completely turned the table upside down. The, 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 the new, our country is in a new direction. And it's a direction that's away from God. I mean, like Israel, I think we've denied the Lord and we've defied His law. And I think we defiled the land. And I think the number one way we defiled the land since 1973 is through the killing of unborn babies. God took His glory away from Israel when they allowed such atrocity. And He'll do the same with America, and He has done. If, if listen, if the, the song we sang this morning... There's a phrase in that song, America the Beautiful. I think it's, uh, it's, Thine alabaster cities gleam undimmed by human tears. That's a reference to the United States having never been attacked. The, 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 the 48 states here, we know about Hawaii and the, the, the attack on Pearl Harbor. But you know what? That song, that line isn't true anymore as of September 11th, 2001. But that, and that should have been enough of a wake-up call. But my, how far have we slid in just 14 years and gone away from God? If that wasn't enough, and the 3,000 lives, if that's not enough, what will it take for America to come back to God? God raised up 13 judges to deliver Israel from backsliding and to try to bring about a revival to Israel. And for the outline this morning, I'm going to use an illustration that I came across that is dealt with, deals with a family fortune. When a family becomes wealthy, there's three stages that occur. The very first stage is the first generation generates the fortune. The first generation generates the fortune. The second generation speculates their fortune and through a series of compromises and foolish decisions, they speculate the fortune. The third generation will dissipate the fortune and it's gone. But I think how it works in a family is how it works in a nation. There's a generation that generates the freedom. Then there's a generation that speculates it away. And finally there's a generation that dissipates it until it's completely gone and freedom's no more. And if you don't believe that, you just study the nations that have forgotten God. And you'll see the downfall. Well, let's talk about the generation of the freedoms. We know with Israel under Joshua, they entered into the promised land. And they were given victory after victory 
after victory. God had promised them the victory and promised them the land as an inheritance. The wall of Jericho came tumbling down. Many, many victories were won by them against the enemies of the land. And victories that would never have been won were it not for the power of God and not for the help of God. And I believe that's how it was with America. I think you can go back to the Revolutionary War and though Britain had more men and more money and better machinery, I mean, if there ever was a David versus a Goliath, it was that one. And yet, the United States was victorious. And I believe with all my heart we were victorious because God was on our side. The stories, and it's well documented that you could read of the times that men took dead aim at General Washington. And even to the point where they, they were amazed when they saw he was still alive. And when he took his coat off from battle, there are bullet holes in the coat. And he is unharmed. Unexplainable things. Except for God. Patrick Henry, who gave the speech that sparked the revolution in 1775, said, quote, Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains or slavery? Forbid it, Almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. And it was game on, so to speak, and the war began. The war was won, and George Washington became our first president. And when he took his first oath of office, he placed his hand upon a holy Bible. And he was done with his oath, he kissed the Bible. And his first official act was to lead the entire Congress in a two-hour worship service. I wonder how the ACLU would like that one. In his inaugural address, he said, No people can be bound to acknowledge and adore the invisible hand which conducts the affairs of men more than the people of the United States. Every step by which they had advanced to the character of an independent nation seems to have been distinguished by some token of providential agency. In plain English, he said, it's pretty evident it's God that got us this far, and we better not forget Him now. I believe the Founding Fathers made it abundantly clear that this land was founded upon God and His Word. You know, for years, the Bible was a textbook in the public school system. This is how children learned to read, was reading the Bible. That was, listen, that was the generation that got us our freedom and that purchased our freedom at a great cost. But then we come to the speculation. Just like succeeding generations in Israel begin to squander it away, and, and, and squander that uh, blessing of God that they had. In fact, look at Judges chapter 2, would you please? Judges 2. Look what God says in verse 1. The angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt and have brought you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down their altars... But ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have ye done this? Won't that be a frightening thing? Wouldn't it be amazing? Won't, wouldn't it be something when you stand before God one day, having broken His law and broken His commands, and God looks at you and says, Why have you done this? I don't know about you. I don't want to be in that position. That's where Israel was. God's saying, I've, I've given you this and you've broken it. What have you done? I, I brought you out of Egypt. I fed you with manna. I guided you. I guarded you. I took care of you. I brought you in the promised land. I've given you the victory. What did I get for that, God says? Disobedience. You didn't want to follow me. 
Verse 7, all the people served, and the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. Verse 10, and also all the generations were gathered under their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. How sad. And all that means is this, folks. There arose a generation that the previous generation did not teach them and tell them about God. Didn't bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And we can talk all about, hey, let's get prayer back in the schools. Let's get the Bible back in the schools. Hey, let's get prayer back in the home and let's get the Bible back in our homes. Let's get the home right with God, and then we'll get the church right with God, and then we'll look at the school getting right with God. But we have to get our priorities in line. And parents owe it to the next generation to tell them of the works of God. That's why, that's why I think, listen, we have a children's church, and they're, they're up through fourth grade or out in children's church this morning. But listen, in Sunday night, they're in church, and through the summertime on Wednesday night, they're in church. Why, they, they need to be around some older people who talk about the things of God and know about the things of God and hear the Word of God, and they need, we need to pass that on to another generation. They don't need to be isolated from the previous generation. We do that sadly in too many churches. They never hear what God's done. I believe... That process began back in the 60s, maybe prior to that. And we've been brainwashed by humanism, situation ethics, relativism, and we lost our moral foundation. We've lost the moral compass that guided us for years. One of the saddest verses in the book of Judges is the very last verse in the book. It's Judges 21 and verse 25, and it says this, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That's, that's a sad verse. In other words, the people became a people with no absolutes, no standard to live by. You know what it was? Well, if, I'm not going to tell you that's wrong if you want to do that. I mean, I, I'm not going to do that, but I can't tell you it's wrong. See, that's a language of people who have no absolute. They have no standard of authority. No book to believe in. And the parallels are frightening. And the Barna Research Group says that 67% of Americans, that's nearly 7 out of 10, say that there is no such thing as absolute truth. And by the way, it's kind of ironic, isn't it? So you're absolutely saying there's no such thing as absolute truth. If you say that, then you believe there must be an absolute truth. You can't have it both ways. But they say that right and wrong are not clear. What's wrong for you is not necessarily wrong for me. And if that doesn't scare you, consider what they did in the same survey... In, in, in evangelical churches, that is simply gospel preaching churches, among Sunday morning attendees, 52% said the same thing. In other words, people who go into church every Sunday said the same thing. They're part of that 70% that says there's no such thing as absolute truth. And if you're here this morning and, and you're just come to church on a Sunday morning and you don't go to church any other time, I want you to hear something this morning. This book right here, which is God's Word, is absolute truth. And you better believe... What, listen, whether you believe it or not doesn't change the fact that it is. God said it, and that settles it. We better believe it. There are things that are right, and there's things that are wrong. And oh, that we'd have a political candidate that would just stand up and say, this is right, and that's wrong. But we, we dance around and we're so afraid of being politically incorrect and, and, and getting ostracized by society. I'm not, I, I, don't know, I don't know a whole lot about uh, Donald Trump 
I don't know a lot about what he believes as far as social issues or anything, but you know what I like? He'll speak what he believes. And I think that resonates with voters. Why? We're looking for somebody to be a leader. Somebody to tell it like it is. And, and, and because he says some things that, that aren't politically correct and doesn't tiptoe through the tulips, then, then everybody ostracizes him. But we need a leader again who will speak up what's right and say there are things that are right and things that are wrong. But imagine, we have 52% of people who would say they're Christians attending gospel preaching churches on a Sunday morning in America who says there are no absolute right or wrongs. That's frightening. Now Israel got to this point through a series of compromises. That's how we get to that point as well. You know what God had told them? God had told them to utterly drive out all the enemies out of the land. That was his instruction. Verse number 2, again, from chapter 2. Notice what he said. Ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down their altars. But ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have ye done this? Wherefore also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. They were to separate themselves and, and not have anything to do with the inhabitants of Canaan, but they didn't obey God. Notice the Canaanites, they feared. Look at verse 19 of chapter 1. And the Lord was with Judah, and He drave out the inhabitants of the mountains, but could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had chariots of iron. They, they could have trusted in God. God could drive them out. The, the Egyptians had the chariots of iron. He took care of them. And he could have taken care of this enemy as well, but they did not look to God to help them. So they decided we better accommodate them. We better surrender to them, or we better learn to live with them. And I think there's some Canaanites that we fear in America as well. Most of our leaders, too many of our leaders, and our present leader wants to pretty much give up on this war on terrorists. Think we can negotiate our way out of it. Think we need to quit trying to win. And I think we make a grave mistake if we just pull all of our men home to America. Because then the fight will come here to America. You understand, as long as we take the fight to them, we fight them there. But the day's coming when they'll fight us here. Politicians today want to end the war on drugs. They pretty much say we've lost, so we should just surrender and legalize all the drugs. They think if we legalize it, we can control it. Yeah, how's that work with alcohol, by the way? I think we heard that story before. Well, I didn't hear it, but Don Taylor was alive then, and he remembers hearing it. And they said that same argument after the prohibition. See, someone said trying to legalize dr control drugs by legalizing is trying to control a, a fire with gasoline. It's not going to happen. We're, we're so busy at putting the ambulances at the bottom of the cliff instead of putting a fence up at the top of the hill. <coughs> we're, we're, we got it all backwards. All we're saying is, listen, let's, let's stop going along with the culture and let's confront the culture with the truth of the Word of God. It's time for Christians to stand. You know, when the Lord gave that, that description in Ephesians 6 about the armor of God, He's saying, having done all, Stand. Stand, therefore. Three different times He reminds us, take your stand. There's no armor for the back, Christian. We're not turning and running. We are moving forward. And we're to press on and we're to take our stand against the world. Young people, God, God desires your purity. Your goal, young person, 
Listen to me. Your goal ought to be to walk down an aisle one day and give yourself to a young man or give yourself to a young woman and be a virgin when you do so. And not only a virgin, but you ought to be one that not everybody's handled and, and, and passed all over and, and had their mouth all over you either. Don't, don't, be, don't walk down like a, like a bottle of Gatorade that's been passed around the football huddle. Nobody cares for that. Keep yourself pure. Keep yourself pure. And you're not going to do that if you don't plan to do that. If you don't prepare to do that. And it's not impossible. You may not like that, but I really don't care. <laughs> if, the, the truth, if the truth is offensive, then you get offended with the truth. Am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Got to get back to the truth again. We get so politically correct about this as we spoke last Sunday evening about the homosexuality issue. Everybody's afraid to say anything about it. We, we and even believers, uh, so Christian people are like, well, you know, I, I'm personally against it, but whatever they do is their business. And we bought into that logic. We understand that the difficulty is they're not just wanting any kind of equal status, they want exalted status. Special status. And I, I again reiterate it's it's the attitude, listen, it's it's just it's just flat out sin. And it's no different than than the list it's it's listed in a list of sins. It all stems from the wickedness of our heart. You say, oh, follow your heart. Oh, that's the worst advice anybody will give you. Follow God. Don't follow your heart. Every man's tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Own desires of your heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We follow God. Socialism. We have, a, we have a fellow named Bernie Sanders. It's an out-and-out -out socialist. He's running for president of the United States, and he's getting supporters. And the media has promoted it. Socialism. Despite watching other countries go down that road and come to a dead end, We go down that road and become a nation that will have no wealth and no freedom and no reason to work for anything. We are, we are winding down to the tail end of the speculation generation. That's the Canaanites they feared. Notice the Canaanites they favored. Verse 28 of chapter 1. It came to pass when Israel was strong that they put that they put the Canaanites to tribute and did not utterly cast them out. They looked at these people and said, hey, you know what? I got an idea. We can use them. We can make money off these guys. Despite the fact, again, you say, hey, that's a great idea. It'll be a profit to us. But wait a minute. God said, drive them out. God said, don't make any league with them. God said, you have to utterly destroy them. You're not to have anything to do with them. What about America? What about legalized gambling? What about the casinos? What about the lottery? Hmm? You know how they got you know what they push all the time on that stuff? Oh, it's going to help our schools. Oh, it's going to help our roads. All the money that's going to be generated. How's that working out for? Look at the revenue. And nobody looks. Yeah, that's what you said we gain. 
what can we lose by this? No one looks at what we can lose by this. Now we're borrowing and been borrowing and borrowing and borrowing. We're $19 trillion in debt. <coughs> the world is, listen, the world is like a bunch of dominoes that's ready to fall down. Greece is on the brink. The other day in Greece, if you're not following that, Greece is collapsing. Monetarily, they can't make any payments. They're so far in debt. They, they closed the banks the other day. They, they shut it down. In ATM, you could get $66. I thought that's an odd number, isn't it? Was it? I think it was $66, all you could withdraw from your account. They froze everything else. By the way, a year or two ago, when they first started this process, they gave everybody what they called a haircut. Say, what's that? They went into your savings account and your bank account, and they took... I think it was 20% off everybody's account. And they, they took it for them, for the government. We need it. And if it can happen there, it can happen here. Borrowing, borrowing. China, China owns more of the U.S. than we do. Just, see, just like Israel, we have to be careful that we don't favor the world. The Canaanites they feared, the Canaanites they favored, but then they had Canaanites they fellowshiped with. Look at verse 32. It says, But the Asherites dwelt among the Canaanites, the tribe of Asher. They dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. Well, hey, I... I know God said get rid of them, but you know what? We found out, we talked to these people. You know what? They seem pretty nice. They're good people. They're good neighbors. They found our dog when he got lost and brought him home. They must be good people. Well, I know they got different gods. And you find out that's why God didn't want them with them. He said, you'll go after their gods. You'll go into idolatry. And the sacrificing of their children to Molech, which is what they did. And we get that way with people in our society as well. You have to be careful. You're not going to help anybody by accepting their sin. I'm not going to help an alcoholic by accepting his drinking. I'm not going to help a whoremonger by accepting their immorality. You're not going to help uh, the extortioner or the thief by accepting the fact they steal things. And you're not going to help the one involved in homosexuality by accepting the fact you're homosexual. You help people in sin by confronting their sin. And by, by, by confronting them with the truth of God. They didn't do that. And if we tolerate it, you know, there's that, that verse in Romans at the end that says, not only do such things, but have pleasure in them that do them. So, oh, I don't do that, but I think it's okay that they do it. God says, you're going you're gonna to have some judgment upon you as well. Do you think... Do you think everybody in Sodom and Gomorrah, do you think everybody there was homosexual or a sodomite? No, they weren't. But they thought it was okay. They thought that's okay. The parallels are very paralyzing. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And eventually the third step came, and that was dissipation. We mentioned it in verse 3 of chapter 2. Notice what he says, I will not, Wherefore I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as, notice, thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. Thorns and snares. After 9-11, Jerry Falwell said, We better realize that God's removing His protective hand from our nation. And he specifically cited 
our national sins of abortion and homosexuality. And of course, the liberal media crucified him. But I think we go 14 years later and we look and say, guess what? He was right. And God, I believe, is using the current leadership in our country to give us exactly what we've been asking for. It's changed, all right. But it's not change we believe in. Thorns and snares. Thorns and snares. And an economic disaster is looming for America. Say, boy, that's pretty doom and gloom, preacher. Just trying to tell you like it is. It's where we live. Well, a loving God allow that to happen? Hmm? Yes. Because we told God we don't need Him. And we told God we don't want Him. We've told God you're not welcome in our country anymore. And we're in a new generation. We read the stats from 1990 till now. We're in a new generation. And it's, it very well may be the final gen generation. Our forefathers generated so much. Our parents speculated it away and now the generation is upon us that will dissipate it until it's completely gone. There's only one generation from losing our country. Now, is there any hope? There's always hope. If there's God, there's always hope. The only hope is God. Look at verse 16 of chapter 2. Well, look at verse 15 first. It says, Whithersoever they went, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil. As the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed, nevertheless... The Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. God rose up judges to deliver them. You heard me say before, He'll raise them up, they'd be delivered, they'd make promises to God, and then they'd go away from God. God would have to oppress them, and God would judge them. They'd cry out to God, and God would be merciful and raise up a judge and deliver them again. God's done that for America time and time again. A benevolent gentleman during the Civil War saw a young lady being auctioned off as a slave. He began to bid just above every bid he heard until finally he won the auction, paying a very high price. And after winning, he began to walk away, and the young girl he bid on began to follow him. And he said, young lady, I bought you not to own you, but to set you free. Free, she asked. He said, yes, free to go wherever you want to go and to do whatever you wish to do. And she looked at him and said, then I choose to go with you. Then I choose to go with you. After all that God has done for America, after all that God has provided for America, all that God has done in protecting America, can we shake our fist at Him? Can we, can we spit in the face of God and say, we don't want you, we don't need you? Or should we say, I choose to go with you. I choose to go with you. And if you're here this morning and you never received Christ as your Savior, would you consider all He's done for you? The Bible says He came and He was beaten was mocked he was spit upon he was crucified and the Bible says he did it for us God committed his love toward us and while we were yet sinners Christ died for us he was punished in your place and if he did all that for you to pay your sin debt Shouldn't you accept His gift of eternal life? Shouldn't you say, if you did that for me, I'll trust you as my Savior? 
wouldn't you want to choose Him and be with Him forever? Christian, we're to be salt and light, the Bible says. In other words, basically, listen, we're to have an impact in our world. And listen, I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not saying for a minute this morning that the problems of this world and the problems of our country are the fault of the heathen in our land. I believe they're the fault of us. I believe churches, I believe God's people have not stood up and proclaimed the truth strong enough and long enough and hard enough. It's just like people today, we've been in church now one hour and 33 minutes. And some of you think, when is he going to quit? But if you were home watching a movie, you would be fine with an hour and 33 minutes. If I'm watching the ball game, I'm fine with an hour and 33 minutes. Therein lies our problem. There's our trouble. You see, God told Solomon, if you ever wander away from my commandments and you go astray and you serve other gods and you go into idolatry, he told Solomon, he didn't say, he didn't blame it on the people who are in idolatry. He didn't blame it on the heathen nations. He said, if my people, which are called by my name, they need to humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I'll hear from heaven and I'll forgive their sin and I'll heal their land. Salt and light. Salt's a preservative and light exposes the darkness. That's our job. He says, well, you shouldn't tell me I'm sinning. Hey, I'm just shining the light on the darkness. Maybe that ought to be a response. Salt holds back the corruption. If you're at work and somebody starts to tell a dirty joke and they look and notice that you're there and they stop and won't continue to tell it, then you're, doing, you're having the right effect. You are being salt in the workplace. You're holding, you're, you're, you're holding back corruption. That's the way it ought to be. But listen, we have a standard, folks. Let's lift up the standard. Pray that God would spare America. Pray that God would give us a leader that would lift up His Word. And be a leader. Not, not politically correct, be a leader. And say, thus saith the Lord, and what's true. Let's not bring the standard down to men. Let's bring men up to the standard. Let's, let's, let's ask God that we might come back to Him. But it starts with us. Don't pray for everyone. Pray for me. Pray for yourself first. It's not my brother or my sister. It's me, O oh Lord. Let's each do what we ought to do to bring America back to God. Let's pray. Shall we, Father, take the truth this morning. Thank you for the attention of each one today. Lord, thank you for the plainness of your word. And, Lord, the parallels we see here between Israel and between America. And how they left you and wandered from you and defied you and denied you. We see that in our country, God. It grieves our heart as Americans, as Americans, as Christians. Lord, we know we've read the back of the book. We know the prophecies, and we know how it's going to end up, and we know that your plan is in motion. Yet, Lord, we want to fulfill our responsibility, and we want to be what we should be in your sight. We don't want to dissipate the freedom that's been entrusted to us. We want to keep it. We want to promote it. Lord, I pray that each of us would take our stand for the truth in our own little world, our own little corner of the world, that our own little corner of the country that we occupy. If we get enough churches and enough of God's people doing that, if you would have spared Sodom and Gomorrah for ten righteous, I pray we'll get ten righteous in America. Speak to our hearts this morning. 
Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. No one looking this morning. I wonder. I wonder with their heads bowed and eyes closed how many folks in the room would say, Pastor, if, if I died this morning, I know that I'd go to heaven. I have Christ as my Savior. I know that I'm saved and I have eternal life and I'll go to heaven one day. Would you put your hand in the air as a testimony to that? Say, I know that I'm saved. God bless you. You may put them down. If you're here today and would say, Pastor, I, I didn't know anybody can be sure that if they die, they go to heaven. I've never heard that before. My friend, the Bible says that these things are written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that you have eternal life. So God says you can know that. And if you're here this morning and say, Pastor, I don't know. If I died, whether I go to heaven or hell, I don't know. Would you let me pray for you? Will not embarrass you, will not call you out, but I'll just pray for you. Would you slip your hand up right now and say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm not sure if I died where I'd go. Just remember me in prayer. All right. God's people here this morning. Those who profess to know Christ. Will you do your part to bring your country back to God? You're going to have to take a stand. You're going to have to speak the truth. We're going to confront the sin of the land. We will not be politically correct. It's the only hope we've got. To take our stand for God. I wonder how many would say, Preacher, God spoke to my heart today. The Spirit of God stopped at my seat. And I appreciate you praying for me this morning. Would you slip your hand up, Christian? Say, pray for me today. Yes. Amen. Amen. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray, and we're going to have an invitation, an opportunity for us to pray for our country this morning. God has spoken to your heart today. I want you to respond to him. If you're here today and you've never received Christ as your Savior, you don't know what that's about. We have people here who have been trained. They'll take the Bible. They'll show you how you can know for sure when you die, you'll go to heaven. Best news you ever hear in your life. When others are coming to pray, you just slip from your seat, come to the front, and someone will take the Bible. We'll take you into the, the small room here, and we'll show you how you can know you're on your way to heaven. Don't miss that opportunity. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to hearts today. Lord, I pray your blessing now and your invitation this morning. May your will be done in every heart and life. Help each one to do what you're bidding them to do, and I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing the invitation. God has spoken to your heart today. The altar is open to come and pray for your country. Have thine own way, Lord. That's right. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now, as in thy presence. Humbly I bow, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Wounded and weary, help me, I pray. Power, all power, surely is thine. Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold o'er my being absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see. Christ only always living in me.
Father, we bow before you in prayer now, and we thank you, Lord, for speaking to our hearts today. Amen. It's been a wonderful service. And Lord, I pray you would uh, help us to leave this place aware that we need to be salt and light in our world. But Lord, we're not here to try to find favor with the people of the world. We're here to find favor with our God. Yeah. We're here to obey your laws. We're here to walk in your ways. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. Amen. And I pray that we would take our stand in our nation, that you'd see fit to call our nation back to thee. Help us to do what we ought to do. And we trust that you'll do what only you can do. Give us a good afternoon now, Lord. Give us a good Lord's Day and bring us back for the services this evening now. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's sing God Bless America together one more time before we leave. Brother Bob. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the ocean, white with home. God bless America, my home sweet home. God bless America, my home sweet home. Amen. You're dismissed. We'll see you tonight.